When it comes to imaging different regions of the brain, there are a variety of tools available and it kind of depends on what we want to look at in the brain, whether we want to look at structures or whether we want to look at blood flow. Um, depending on what we want to see, we would use a different imaging technique. So what we're going to take a look at here are just some of the more common ones, just so you have an awareness of how the brain can be visualized. A CT scan is the first on the list here. CT stands for computed tomography. This is a type of imaging technique that does use x-rays and it's based on the absorption of x-rays in soft tissues, which of course the brain is soft tissue underneath the skull. Um, it's, all, it's all soft. So CT scans would be one option for looking at brain structures. PET, this is another type of imaging technique. This stands for positron emission tomography. And this is one that's kind of interesting, a PET scan. Uh, what this does is it allows us to see regions in the brain that are actively using glucose. And the way that this can be done is by using a special form of glucose. It's one that's radioactively labeled. So that glucose, once it's in the body, um, what happens to glucose, right? It gets taken up by cells that are metabolically active. And so if we can actually see that glucose because it's radioactively labeled, then what that will allow us to do is see the different regions of the brain that are more active than others. So this is very useful for, for monitoring cancers, cancers that are in the brain, because cancerous cells use energy at a greater rate than non-cancerous cells, so it allows a, a clear visualization of that. An MRI, this is actually what the image is shown on the slide right now. This is an MRI, magnetic resonance imaging. In this case, um, what's used are, are, power, are magnets, magnets that cause different ions to align in the magnetic field. And that can be interpreted by a computer. Um, that signal gets interpreted and allows us to see distinctions between gray matter and white matter and cerebrospinal fluid. The fluid is very dark in these pictures. It allows us to see the ventricles pretty clearly. A couple of others, there's something called a functional MRI on the next slide. A functional MRI, this is something that allows us to see blood flow specifically, blood flow to the different regions of the brain. Um, MEGs, magnetoencephalograms, these are also based on magnetic fields. Um, magnetic fields get produced anytime charges move. So think back to what we learned about action potentials and postsynaptic currents. Um, if we've got ions moving, then we're going to have magnetic fields being generated around the brain. And that's something that can be detected with an MEG. MEGs are pretty accurate. They're more accurate than EEGs, which is our last um, visualization technique we're going to mention here. EEGs, electroencephalograms, these are, are a little bit more familiar. This is something you've probably seen, maybe if not in real life, um, in movies. This is where they show like electrodes attached to the scalp, and those electrodes can detect synaptic potentials that are taking place on those surface cells. Um, so just um, really focused on on the the gray matter that's at, on the surface of the cerebral cortex. EEGs do allow us to see different brainwave patterns, and there are four really characteristic brainwave patterns. So we call them alpha, beta, theta, and delta waves. And I want to show you some pictures of what these waves look like. Each one is a little bit different. Alpha waves, these are the types of waves that exist if you're awake but relaxed. So here are some alpha waves over here. Mostly these uh, seem to come from the frontal and parietal lobes of the brain. So alpha waves, if you're awake and relaxed, um, those lobes will be making alpha waves. If you are awake and paying attention to something, like hopefully right now, you're hopefully learning some things, your brain is probably making beta waves. So these are um, primarily produced from mental activity and also due to visual stimulation. So if you're taking in information, uh, the frontal lobe is what will be making these beta waves. Coming down the list, Theta waves, a little bit more relaxed. This is a type of brainwave that happens during sleep, mostly from the occipital and temporal lobes. We see theta waves. Delta waves also happen during sleep, but they come from all over the cerebrum. So delta waves right there at the base. Let's talk about sleep. We've just mentioned sleep happen. Um, these two types of waves, theta and delta waves, happen during sleep. So a little bit of information about sleep. 
generally sleep is something that does involve neurotransmitters, which we learned about in the last chapter. So um, particularly histamine, this is a neurotransmitter that promotes wakefulness. And then adenosine and GABA, these are neurotransmitters that help to promote sleep. So um, during sleep, there are two different categories of sleep that are generally recognized. There's REM and non-REM. And what that REM is referring to is what your eyes are doing while you're asleep. Either your eyes are just kind of relaxed and holding still under your eyelids, or they're moving all around. And that's called rapid eye movement. So REM sleep. This is generally what happens when we're dreaming. And this is when we see those theta waves. Non-REM sleep, this is also called resting sleep. Um, it has different stages and, and they're called slow wave sleep because again, looking at the wave patterns, delta waves, these look like slower waves. They don't happen as frequently. So this is what we see during slow wave sleep. And um, as far as those different stages go, there's kind of an interesting pattern. When you first fall asleep, what you would enter is non-REM sleep. So you're not dreaming right at first when you fall asleep. Um, so you enter non-REM sleep and then you progress through the four stages. One, two, three, four. After that, you come back up through the four stages. So four, three, two, one. And then uh, you would enter into REM sleep. So start dreaming. So that would then complete a full sleep cycle. Generally, a sleep cycle takes about 90 minutes. So we tend to, most of us at night, we go through about five of these stages every night. If we're allowed to wake up naturally without like an alarm clock or someone waking us up, we tend to do that during REM sleep. So it's kind of towards the end um, of a natural cycle. So it makes sense. We like to complete those cycles and then we feel well rested. A couple of other things about sleep before we move on from this. What's going on during those different different types of sleep uh, during non-REM? What's happening is your neurons in your brain, they slow down, they're not firing as much, and this ends up leading to decreased blood flow and energy metabolism, right? Your brain is not as active, it doesn't need as much blood flow, um, doesn't need as much energy to be metabolized, so things slow down. And this also leads to, or allows a couple of important things to happen. It's thought that non-REM sleep is when a lot of our repairing uh, mechanisms take place in the brain. So, right, we're all exposed to free radicals and these are things that we don't wanna just leave hanging out in the body. We wanna get rid of these so they don't cause problems. So a lot of the repair is carried out during this non-REM sleep when the neurons are nice and calm. And then there's also a lot of evidence to suggest that memory storage happens during this non-REM sleep. So neuroplasticity, remember the like the the building of different bridges between or synapses between neurons. Uh, when does that happen? Well, here's a good chance for it to happen. So this ends up tying in with a lot of our memory storage. If you don't if you don't get a good night's sleep, you probably won't remember things as well about what happened that day. REM sleep. Okay, interestingly with REM sleep, so this is when you're dreaming, there are some regions of the brain that are even more active than when you're awake. So kind of a strange thought there, but when you're dreaming, certain regions of the brain just really get, really get going, um, particularly the limbic system. This is very active during REM sleep. So that kind of makes sense. If you have a bad dream and you wake up and you feel all anxious, makes sense, right? That's because your limbic system was active and that's very tied in with emotions. So during REM sleep, we tend to have really irregular breathing and even heart rate. There are benefits to, uh, to um, REM sleep. This ties back in with memory storage. There's a connection here um, that we're still working to understand. Brains are very complex. There's always more to, to learn and understand about brains. Just to wrap this section out, let's end with something that you can apply, something that's relevant to your lives, um, just in terms of this memory consolidation. So we mentioned a couple of different types of memory storage, and um, let's revisit this because I forgot to elaborate on the differences. Declarative memories versus non-declarative memories. If you don't know the difference between those, um, declarative, this has to do with facts and events, so remembering specific things that took place, whereas non-declarative memories, these have to do with 
um, things like learned skills, being able to carry out certain procedures, um, those are called non-declarative memories. So procedural, procedural memories versus factual memories. In any case, uh, sleep is very important for memory storage to happen properly. And there's an interesting thing, there have been some studies done in terms of just the timing of sleep. So if somebody studies something and then they sleep, um, what is like the optimal amount of time between studying and sleep? And it turns out that just about three hours, a three hour gap is really ideal. So you're really better off, like if you're studying for an exam or something, um, you're better off to study a little bit early in the evening and then give yourself that three hour break and then get a good night's sleep because during sleep is when a lot of that memory long-term storage is going to take place. When you study during the day, it goes into your short-term memory storage, um, but to get it actually locked away in long-term memory storage, this is something that requires sleep. So all nighters are not actually all that great of an idea um, in the long term.